Okay, so for my project that I did this semester, I studied the Kumtor gold mine and orogenic gold deposits, and this mine is located in Kyrgyzstan. Why did you choose these here instead of this one? I chose this region because I've always been interested in Central Asia, and I thought that this would be a good opportunity to learn about the geology, and the Kumtor gold mine was one of the first mines that came up in my search. So, and included in my presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the deposit itself, the mine, and its past and present, and then the setting and the mineralization of the Kumtur gold deposit. And I've included this figure of the geologic time because one of the characteristics of orogenic gold deposits is that they form over a wide range of time. Uh, dating back to the Neoarchean, uh, the Paleo-Proterozoic, and into the Phanerozoic. And that can make them really difficult to classify just because there's a wide time span. And these three different time periods coincide with uh, continental building and they coincide with accretionary tectonics that are necessary. Um, for the mineralization of these deposits that make them what they are. And like I said, through this long period of time, the Earth underwent many changes in its thermal state, in the hydrosphere, and in the atmosphere. And it just helps to make these deposits very difficult to classify. And this is a figure that is similar to what we went over in class. It's not universal by any means, but it illustrates the most simplified hypothesis of which the orogenic gold deposits form from the devolatilization of subducting oceanic crust and the carbonaceous rich sediment in the accretionary uh, wedge on the active continental margin contains the carbon-rich sediment in pyrite. And <coughs> as this region is heated, whether it be from a subducting slab or mantle plume impact or this, um, a sphenospheric upwelling, this region becomes heating or heated and undergoes metamorphism from in the grade of green schist to lower amphibolite facies. And this region hosts the gold mineralization and it undergoes compression and extension and crustal thickening. And it becomes very structurally complex and it helps to facilitate the mineralization. So these are just a list of some of the key characteristics. Um, deposits form over a wide range of depth ranging from 3 to 15 kilometers. They've been forming since the Archean until present. Uh, they're very structurally complex with both compressional features and extensional. Um, they, the majority of people believe that uh, these gold deposits are associated with metamorphism in the accretionary wedge. Um, the, the fluids come from the metamorphism. I've read in some papers that uh, others believe that the fluids are associated with uh, the crystallization of intermediate magmas, but there's still a lot of views on how these deposits are forming. Like I mentioned, uh, these deposits are very uh, difficult to classify. There isn't one universal model to classify them. Um, the que there's many questions such as, are these deposits um, pre-collisional, syn-collisional, post-collisional? Um, should they be classified by different depths? Or should all of these deposits be lumped together. People have different views 
on that. It seems like there are unique deposits in different parts of the world, but I myself would have to <laughs> do more research to determine whether or not it's pretty complicated. <laughs> so the Kumtor gold mine and its deposits are located in the Tian Shan metallogenic belt of Central Asia, and this region extends for around 2,500 kilometers across Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, southern Kazakhstan, and into western China. And so this region is home to many world-class gold and copper deposits. Kind of has some mines highlighted here. And the Kumtor gold mine is located in the, I guess it's considered the middle Tian Shan, and in the technical report that I referred to during my research, um, the consulting company that worked with Centera Gold in compiling the report, they identified four different deformation events that are associated with the Kumtor Gold deposit with the first two deformational events dating back to pre-carboniferous. And the metamorphism <coughs> peaked at the, during the first deformational event, the metamorphism peaked at the green, fish, green schist facies. And um, by the third deformational event, which um, ranged from Carboniferous to Permian. There was folding and schistosity shistos <laughs> occurring. And um, the fourth deformation, deformational event uh, ranges from the tertiary until present. And they've identified the age to be Carboniferous to early Permian and they've identified many different mineralized structures that are pre-syn and post-collisional. So the Kumtor gold deposit itself is located in the Desmatov formation, which is approximately 800 to 900 meters thick. And it's very structurally complex. Um, it's full of thrust faults and other types of deformational features. Um, the mineralized zone itself is, of the central deposit is one and a half kilometers by half a kilometer. And in my research, all of the papers cited the work of Ivanov and Ivanov has identified four stages in the gold mineralization that took place with the Kumtor gold deposit. And the first stage of mineralization, well, the first stage in the mineralization is characterized by a lot of hydrothermal alteration and brecciation. And the second stage <coughs> is characterized by um, intensive veining and stock work formation, and it's dominated by some of the characteristics minerals or pyrite, and it's also dominated by carbonates at this stage in time. And the third stage, again, is dominated by more veining and brecciation. And by the fourth stage, there's more concentration of mineralization along the highly deformed areas in the deposit. This is just a Google Earth map showing the geographic location of the Kumtor gold mine in Kyrgyzstan. It's not too far from China. And this is a map that was produced in the technical report by of the Kumtor gold mine 
you can see here's the life of mind design of the central pit. And here is the design for the southwest pit. And they haven't yet begun the Saratour pit, but uh, production, mining and production have been occurring in the southwest and central pits. And this mine is located in an alpine environment. Um, the highest mining activity is occurring at 4,400 meters. And uh, the administration is around 3,600 meters. So it's pretty high up there. It's highly glaciated. There's five glaciers, as you can see, surrounding <coughs> the pits. There's a glacial lake, which is approximately five kilometers um, upstream from the tailings pond. Um, and I've read that the permafrost can be up to 250 meters thick in this region. So those are all factors that can make mining difficult and expensive in this region. <coughs> um, there are a lot of people that believe that they're receding extra, well, receding, but they're also um, surging onto the mine. And glacial mining has been an essential feature since production has begun, and I'll go into that more later in the presentation. Um, these are just some key events that I identified in the mine's history. The general exploration of this area took place in the 1920s by Soviet scientists. And by 1992, Sentara's parent company developed interest in the region and they started making negotiations with the Kyrgyz government to begin mining. And by 1997, the mining of the central pit commenced and production began after a total expenditure of almost $500 million. And um, as of 2014, when the technical report was published, 9.9 .9 million ounces of gold have been recovered from almost 100 million tons. And the average gold grade is, I, I saw different numbers, but I'll say between three and four grams per ton. And as of right now, the life of the mine will extend until 2023, and the mill will continue producing until 2026. This is just a photo of the central pit. You can see a glacier. This is just uh, another geologic map produced by the mine. And you can see that the central pit is dominated by uh, metasomatized rocks and phyllites. You can see the Kumpfer Fault cut across the central pit. And in the light purple outline, you can see the um, central pit outline as of 2014 for the central pit and the southwest pit. And the dark bl blue line is the actual projected life of mine design that they hope to reach. <coughs> this is a cross section of the central pit and I thought it was interesting because it shows the topography before excavations began and then it shows the progress as of 2014 and then the life of mine projected design. You can see uh, the fault zone, lots of metasomatized rocks and it's just highly deformed with thrust faults and fractures. Um, and now we'll get into some of the controversies associated with this mine. As I mentioned earlier, uh, glacial ice mining has been an essential feature in the mining activity. And uh, I don't know the exact volume of ice that's been extracted, but uh, it's something that has been occurring since mining began in this area. 
uh, they remove the ice in order to like excavate in the pit. And another potential problem is, as I showed in the map, there's a glacial um, lake upstream from the tailings pond. And if this pond were to breach its terminal moraine and start flooding, the flood water could erode the tailings pond and cause waste to be to leak out into the environment and then the flooding could definitely shut down mining operations. And from what I've read, there's no lining in the tailings pond because of the deep permafrost. And so if there are major changes in the climate, that waste could leak and cause havoc to the environment. And there's also been protests and um, violence and torture to against um, the locals that have protested against the mine. And another event that I read about was a truck accident um, ended up dumping almost 2,000 kilograms of sodium cyanide into the river. And I'm not sure how that was taken care of, but that was an event that I read about. And this is just a quote from the technical report that is just basically stating that the glacial ice mining has been an essential feature to operations at this mine. And if they had to stop, then mining would shut down. And they wouldn't be able to access the deposit like they would like to. And this is just a photo that I found online of some of the glacial ice mining to give you an idea of the size and scale. And this is a photo from 2000 showing the pit and a glacier. And then this is 2015 and you can just see how much of the ice has been removed and then excavation that has been taking place in that time period. And this is a reference that I used for the technical report. Um, it's 273 pages long. I found it really interesting and it's available to the public online. So I'd recommend it. Thank you. From what I understand, they're, I, they're mining ice in order to do more excavation in the ground. Like the ice is covering the ground that they're trying to access. And so that's what I understand. And I'm not really sure if other mines do that. I haven't heard of any. I don't know. Melt it, dump it somewhere. I, I don't know. <laughs> 